bringing the message today. I'll give you one guess. He's right there. Pastor Dave's back on the stage. Pastor Dave. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Good to see you, everyone. Uh, Pastor Donnie is in Stillwater, Oklahoma this morning. Uh, the Texas men's tennis team advanced all the way to the national championship today. So they'll be playing TCU. Uh, as you guys know, Donnie oversees all Olympic sports, but he also directly oversees women's volleyball and men's tennis. And women's volleyball were back-to-back -back national champs. And then tennis has a chance today to become national champions. And so I've been texting with him all weekend and following it. And uh, he's pretty stoked. And then uh, he gets back, uh, I think, tonight and then jumps on a plane tomorrow to go meet the volleyball team in Hungary. Uh, they're on a tour over there. And so, yes, busy time, busy time for him. So as Pete said, uh, we're entering into a new series this morning uh, called The Power of an Invitation. And I shared with our prayer team this morning that uh, this subject is really important because um, not only is God always inviting us into things, he's inviting us into know him more. He's inviting us into being a part of what he's doing. He's, he, so the invitation is always there. 19 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was inviting people, recorded where he was telling them, come follow me. And so this idea of invitation is biblical and it's important, but it's also almost everything that you see in the Bible where God was moving happened because somebody took the time to either send an invitation or respond to an invitation. That's, that is the New Testament. In invitation going out, invitation being responded to. So as we get started this morning, uh, I want to talk here. Uh, in 2014, there was a, uh, a movie that I really looked forward to seeing. It was actually produced surprisingly by Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and she produced this movie called Unbroken. And it's this story of this guy, Louis, Louis Zamperini. And Louis Zamperini uh, grew up in Southern California, and he grew up in a, in a very turbulent situation. He was bullied a lot. He uh, started smoking and drinking at a young age. Uh, by the time he was in eighth grade, he was headed down the wrong path. And two invitations absolutely changed the trajectory of his life. The first invitation came when he was 14 years old. His older brother, Pete, who was a track star himself, he saw Louis going down this wrong direction. And he invited him, a simple invitation. He invited him to simply come and begin to run with him. Louis, just come run with me. And Louis Zamparini took him up on that offer and within a short period of time became a phenomenal runner, won the California State Championship, got a full ride scholarship to USC, and won and competed in the 1936 Olympics in Germany. To this day, he's still the youngest 5,000-meter person to ever qualify for the Olympics, just over 19 years of age. It all started, the change started, because his brother noticed something and issued a simple invitation. But the story goes on. In 1941, he enrolls in the, the Air Force Army. He's on a mission in the Pacific, and, and their plane hits a mechanical failure, and it goes down 
in the ocean. And for 47 days, him and two other people float in the Pacific Ocean. They've come ashore on the Marshall Islands where they're taken captive. He's taken to four different camps, prisoner of war camps, where he is beaten ruthlessly that entire time because they knew he was an Olympic athlete. He survives. He's rescued. He comes back. And in 2003, Louis Zamperini is talking on CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network, and he's talking about when he came back. He said, I had nightmares every night. I had become an alcoholic. I was drinking every night to try to get rid of and suppress the terror and the pain and all this stuff. And the second invitation comes that would absolutely change his life. His wife, Cynthia, a week before had gone to this young evangelist outreach named Billy Graham. And Cynthia and her friends invite Louis Zamperini to come to hear Billy Graham in Los Angeles. And Louis Zamperini says, man, I don't want to go. I don't want to be a part of this. There is no God. And they persuade him to go. And in 2003 on CBN, he tells, he says, I'm sitting there listening to, to this man talk to me. And God began to remind me of all the prayers I had prayed on the raft. All the prayers I had prayed in the prisoner of war camp. He received Jesus that night, and he said that he never had another nightmare again. Not only that, but Louis Zamperini became a world-famous evangelist, actually going back to Japan in 1950 and going into the very camps of the people that used to torture him, preaching a message of forgiveness, and many of those guards received Christ. His life was changed by two simple invitations. Come run with me, come to a meeting. There is a power in invitation. Your ask just might be, somebody's answer. So who are the Louis Zamperinis around us? Who are the children, spouses, family members, extended family members, teammates, coaches, friends, co-workers that are right around us that a simple invitation could change their life. We're going to look today at the very first invitation and the one that's most important. And then we're going to look at three common things that keep us from actually pursuing the invitation. And then last, we're going to see in Scripture the power of an invitation. So on the screen... You'll see it's a famous passage of scripture in Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Jesus is beginning his ministry. I'll read. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Invitation, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he, Jesus, saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, 
And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I think there's three important things that we can pull out of this passage of Scripture because we have to make sure that we are appropriately ourselves responding to the first invitation that Jesus is throwing out to all of us, which is to come follow him, to follow him into his way, into his truth, into his life, into his mission. He was calling Andrew and Peter and James and John to come follow him into an intimate relationship with him. He was calling them to follow him into his, his purpose and mission. And God's doing the same to every single one of us. And we'll see here in a minute that not everybody fully responded to follow Jesus. So here's three things that we can see from this passage of Scripture. Number one, they recognized who was calling them. There was something, there was something different about Jesus' call to them, Jesus' invitation to them. This wasn't just a normal man. This wasn't just a, a religious teacher. There was something in this encounter with Jesus of Nazareth. There was something that apprehended them. There was something different about, about this call. There was something that, that they knew and understood. I mean, at a later point in Scripture, we'll see Jesus calling another individual, and he begins to talk to this individual. He says, hey, before I got here, I saw you sitting under the tree. And he says, how do you know who I am? Because he's God. And he's calling each and every one of us here. He's calling us into a life of significance. And he's calling us into a life of, of purpose beyond. Listen, Peter and Andrew and James and John could have just not responded to that call, not responded to that invitation. They could have continued to do what they were doing. But yet, they changed history, and we're going to see that in a minute. They changed history because they chose to sincerely respond to the call. So they recognized who, who was calling them. It was God, their creator. Secondly, they responded to the invitation with immediate action. Look at what it says. Jesus said, come follow me. I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Then James and John, when they're called, the same thing. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. So they recognized, they responded, but then they rearranged or prioritized their life for the purpose of the invitation. So God is inviting us into his mission. He's inviting us into his purpose. He's inviting us into what, what he's doing. But not everybody responds. So let's go to the second passage. In Luke 9, 57 and 6 through 62, there's a similar thing happening here. Jesus is, is calling. We'll read it. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Guys, when you study the commentary on this particular passage of Scripture, in essence, 
these three people that Jesus is, is encountering in Luke 9, 57 through 62, all of them thought following Jesus was important. They just didn't think it was the most important thing. They all thought it was important. You're going to see that in the text. They just didn't think it was the most important thing. So this individual comes, man comes to Jesus, says, hey, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus discerns that he doesn't really understand the call. He, that he doesn't understand really what this looks like. And as I was reading this week, I read a little article, a guy was writing on this passage of scripture. And he said this, he said, Jesus isn't a false recruiter. He says, when I came out of high school and I was signing up for the Coast Guard, the recruiter who wanted more people to sign up for basic training told me and a friend of mine that there were water there that you could fish, that you could jet ski. <laughs> There was water there, but that's not the reality. He was selling a false bill of goods. So this individual comes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's saying to this man, your idol is your comfort. Because you don't understand that following me is actually going to cost you something. It's going to cost you to follow me. It's going to be well worth it. I mean, there's another place in Scripture where Jesus encounters this rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler chooses to walk away, and Peter, in a moment of weakness and vulnerability, says to Jesus, Jesus, what about us? We've left everything to follow you. And he says, hey, in this lifetime, in the life to come, you will receive 30, 60, and 100 fold. There is a cost to following Jesus, but the rewards are incredible. But this individual didn't really understand. He was more committed to his comfort than actually following Jesus. And guys... This is the culture that we live in today. America, we, we are committed to our comfort at all costs. I don't want to have to sacrifice my time. I don't want to have to sacrifice my relation. I don't want to have to sacrifice my finance. I don't want to have to sacrifice anything. Second, he said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Seems like a normal request. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Commentators will say that when you really dig into this, in the, he, his father had not died. What he was saying to Jesus was, hey, listen, let me go first, get all my needs taken care of, because I have an inheritance that's coming to me when my father dies. Let me get all my ducks in a row. Let me get everything that I want. Then I'll come follow you. It was the distraction of personal security. Personal security. And then last, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus knew he wasn't coming back. 
No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God, Jesus said. This is the distraction or the cost of competing allegiances. Just going to shoot you straight, guys. You read the commentaries on this, how it plays out in our world today, not trying to step on toes. Sorry, you sports are more important to me than the kingdom of God. Sorry, vacation is more important to me than the kingdom of God. Sorry, because here's the thing. I watch people all the time when they're, see, there's a difference between interest and commitment. When you're committed to something, there are no excuses. When you're just interested in something, other things can knock it out of the way. I've watched people who can't make it to church one out of every three months because they always have something. Yet they'll drive 13 hours to watch their kid play a soccer game and not miss it. (laughs) The cost of competing allegiances. And here's the thing. The text doesn't give an answer because the text wants us to ask the same questions that are being asked here. So Jesus is calling us at this point. He's recalling us as individuals, as a church. He's recalling me. Hey, Dave, will you prioritize me? Will you prioritize my kingdom? Will you prioritize my presence? Will you prioritize my mission? Will you, and all this, guys, all this, if I could sum it all up, In one statement, you read anybody in the world who will teach on discipleship, anybody, 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 they will tell you the number one mark of a disciple is availability. Peter, Andrew, James, John, prioritized the kingdom. They dropped what they were doing to go follow Jesus into an unknown. They were available. Were they perfect? No. They were available. And God comes knocking on our door. Dave, will you just be available for me? Now let's just begin to wrap all this up. So Peter, the power of an invitation. Peter responds authentically, sincerely to the invitation to follow Jesus and all that that means. And there was going to be a cost to it. I mean, there was a cost to Peter. But Peter changed the world. We're still talking about him today. He changed the world. And let's watch how this power of invitation plays out. The key passages of Scripture in the book of Acts, the church, it's this turning point where the church is, is, is exploding. And the church is going from Jews to Gentiles. And somebody's right at the center of it. Peter. So let's pick this up in Acts 10, and we're going to look at three different passages of Scripture. Starting in verse 1 through 6 of Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. 
What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa an invitation. Send men to Joppa to bring back an, a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. So the angel says, extend an invitation to Peter. Peter, meanwhile, is up there wrestling with God. He's in Caesarea, and he's having a vision of this unclean food, and he doesn't know what God's trying to tell him, and he keeps saying, no, God, I'm a Jew. I will never touch anything that's unclean. And finally, God says, what I call clean, do not call unclean, the gospel is going to the Gentiles. There are going to be some men that come to you and ex ask and extend an invitation. Go with them. Watch what happens. Verses 19 through 22. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man. He is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. An invitation. An invitation. Peter goes with them, and he shows up at Cornelius' house. Not only had Cornelius invited Peter, but Cornelius had invited his family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, Peter walks in not knowing what to expect. And watch what happens. The next day, 23 through 27, Peter started out with them. And some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives, and close friends. Practical. He just opened his home and said, hey, come. I think there's a message. I think there's a person that can change your... What changed Louis Zamperini's life? Was it therapy? I believe in all that. No, it was a personal encounter with Jesus that changed him. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Come on. What did we say? The number one mark of a true disciple is availability. Peter was available. Cornelius was available. The people themselves were available to come. It wasn't magical. It wasn't deeply theological. It was Cornelius inviting those he cared about to come into his home to experience something and hear something from Peter that changed their life. It changed their life. Peter, God uses him to offer invitation after invitation after invitation. Let me end with this, guys. There's this incredible chain of events 
that lead to the conversion of Billy Graham. Billy Graham, at the time of his death, he preached directly to over 2.2 billion people. It's titled, you can Google it, it's called The Chain of Events Leading to Billy Graham's Conversion. If I asked you this morning, have any of you ever heard of Edward Kimball? I don't think a single person in here would say, yeah, I know who Edward Kimball is. Edward Kimball was a simple Sunday school teacher who had a heart for a few young men that were in his community and that would periodically come to the church. They were wild. They were restless. And one day, Edward Kimball, in praying for one of these young men, says, I'm going to go and offer an invitation for him to meet with me. He goes down to a shoe store where this young man was stocking shelves, and he invited him to have a conversation. In that conversation, he shared the gospel. And this young man responded to the gospel, responded to Jesus, to receive Jesus as the Lord of his life and to want to to live for Jesus. This young man was Dwight L. Moody, who himself ended up touching two continents with the gospel and saw hundreds of thousands come to Christ. Edward Kimball offered a simple invitation to have a conversation with Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody, and D.L. Moody encountered Jesus, and out of that invitation, D.L. Moody preached to two continents with hundreds of thousands coming to Christ. Kimball then invited another young man to meet with him by the name of Wilbur Chapman. Chapman responded to the invitation to meet and accepted Christ. He himself ended up winning thousands to Christ and in one of his crusades invited a young ball player named Billy Sunday to come hear him preach. Sunday had a day off and he went to this meeting and he accepted Christ and became an evangelist. Then another young man was invited named Mordecai Ham. He accepted the invitation and received Christ as well. Ham then went to do some outreach in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a young man named Billy Frank was invited to attend his meetings by friends. That night... Billy Frank went and was intrigued by what he heard. Returning a second night, he responded to the invitation by Mordecai Ham and was converted to Christ. Billy Frank eventually became known as Billy Graham, the evangelist who preached to more people than any person who ever lived, including the Apostle Paul. The fascinating chain of events was triggered by a simple invitation, by a simple Sunday school teacher's concern for a few boys around him. He was quoted as saying, you can count the apples on a tree, but only God knows how many apples are in a single seed. Do your part today in the kingdom of God and trust the results to Jesus. Guys, this church will immediately move on the right direction when we align with Jesus and his heart and his purposes and we simply say, 
as that Sunday school teacher did that nobody knows about. Hear my Lord, send me. Who can I invite to a coffee? Who can I invite to my home? Who can I invite? Can I get together with a couple other couples and say, let's host something at our home and invite some people and pray and see what God might do. I've said this before, guys. My wife is sitting here today because a coworker named Sue Spencer at Viking Office Products in Long Beach, California, began to pray for April Fry and simply reached out with an invitation. April, go eat with me. April will tell you she was there, sitting there. Sue didn't know what was going on in her life. April will tell you she was smoking her Marlboros. Marlboro Lights. She loved to smoke. She said, I love to smoke. Going, oh my gosh, yes, the Jesus thing is so, yes, oh my gosh, you know. And then Sue invited her to church at Hope Chapel, Hermosa Beach with Pastor Zach Nazarian. And April went, and she experienced the presence of God, and it scared her, and she left, and then she avoided Sue like the plague. And Sue just kept loving her and just kept inviting. And April went back to Hope Chapel, as she says it, in her Bob Marley t-shirt, her black high, high top speckled tennis shoes with her big hair, early 90s. And Zach preached the message and said, if you've never truly received Jesus as the Lord of your life, I want you to come down. And she said, her dad, her whole life had said to her, April, don't ever put all your eggs in one basket. And she said, that day, I said, Jesus, I'm putting all my eggs in your basket. And she ran down front like a crazy person and received Jesus. Sue Spencer, an office worker at office, Viking Office Products, a simple invitation. Your invitation just might be somebody's answer. Have the worship team come up. Lord Jesus, you want our hearts first. Help our hearts align with you. Help us put aside comfort and security and allegiances to other things that just don't matter. Align our hearts with your heart for, for, for this world, for people. And God, I'm just praying for a unity over this church. God, align us to your prayer. Open doors for us. Father, we, want, we have a heart to want to see people come to know and experience you. Give us creativity, give us boldness, give us faith. Lord, Father, I'm asking that you would meet us. Just as we see all through Scripture as Peter just simply responded to the invitation and Cornelius responded to the invitation and those family members responded to the invitation. God, you moved. So we're asking you to move in our hearts, to move in our lives to move in this church. We ask it all in your powerful name, in the name of Jesus, amen.